Good afternoon. Uh, uh, good morning. No, good afternoon. Even on the West Coast this afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, participating uh, to the event. Um, let me give you a little bit uh, of housekeeping rules while we're waiting, maybe a couple of others uh, that uh, sign up to join us um, and introduce uh, my name, uh, who I am, uh, who's behind all of this and uh, the idea of the presentation. So um, my name is Giorgio Valentini. I've been working for Grassi for quite some time. So I'm promoting primarily in the East Coast. That's why you're really not many familiar, or many of you are familiar with me. Um, but, you know, I'm happy to uh, present and, um, you know, on behalf of Grassi, uh, I'm based in, uh, in the New York metropolitan area. And um, the idea is basically to uh, organize, I don't know if some of you participated to uh, last uh, event in this uh, semi in a series of talks uh, uh, about uh, Palladio. And uh, in this particular event, uh, we are talking about Palladio connection with uh, Jefferson. Um, considering the event, uh, we're going to keep all of you muted, uh, um, but because the original idea was actually more like a, a friendly chat, uh, the idea is to, uh, uh, that, you know, you are free to unmute yourself, intervene. Uh, we recommend you to use in the uh, chat um, box that you have underneath. Uh, Maria Vittoria is uh, taking care of the technical part and can explain you a little bit. I would like her to do, um, you know, to introduce herself so that you are familiar with her voice for those of you that don't know her. So Maria yeah, Vittoria. Hi. Hello, hello to everybody. Hello from Italy, actually, where I am. I just hope that you will enjoy the conversation. If you have any doubt, I just, uh, uh, you can just use the chat. It should be quite easy. Just, yes. Thank you, Maria Vittoria. Uh, Giacomo is uh, the other uh, window that you see on my right. Um, and uh, he's, uh, he's actually been working quite a bit behind the scenes. Uh, he's the one that put together uh, most of what you're seeing. I just put the salt at the end of the recipe. And I'm just bringing just the, uh, the waiters, uh, bringing the, uh, the food to the table. Um, so I hope I'm not messing up his work. So Giacomo will help me if, um, you know, there's some question on the menu that I'm not capable of answering. Giacomo, if you want to also uh, say a few things, uh, just so they recognize you in your voice. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. If you've got any question uh, by chat, uh, I, can, uh, I can replay by time. Okay. Thank you, Giorgio. All right, excellent. So um, let's go uh, to the point. Uh, and um, we'll talk about Palladio. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna close this screen because I will have to focus on the presentation. So I will be losing you. Unfortunately, it is the, uh, I, I think uh, the best part is seeing your faces, seeing your expression. I want to start with Jimmy Fallon. Um, they told me in the previous presentation, the audio is not that good. It's only one minute. I hope it works and I will explain you why I started with him. So. Now that I've been my kids for a while, because there's a lot of history. Georgia, it doesn't work. Georgia, it doesn't work. Georgia, it doesn't work. Giorgio. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, anyway, it was not really that important. Um, let's uh, jump to this. Um, I just want to make a little bit of a joke uh, because what we are doing here is uh, basically a time travel uh, um, back in history. Uh, in the previous presentation, we took uh, those of you that attended in a time travel geography. We spoke more about uh, the quarries, where we are located, the position. Here we'll be talking primarily on uh, the 1700 and the, and the era of Palladio. Um, 
So we started actually from this article in the New York Times that uh, we featured in the, in the other presentation. And this article is uh, promoting or talking about the um, Palladium Museum that was um, featuring the uh, Jefferson architecture and how the Palladio influenced uh, Jefferson studies and architectures. Um, another, here are just some of the I like, uh, but the article and, uh, I, you know, I share the, um, in the chat or uh, at the end of this presentation, there's actually the uh, bibliography with the, um, with the link. And we'll, uh, you know, it's interesting here are just some of the I like. Uh, uh, they basically explain, uh, um, you know, where they both come from, uh, the history, and uh, a little uh, figurative conversation between uh, the two. And there's a nice video on YouTube, which I will uh, sh not show you the video because it's probably too long and it's all in Italian, but the subtitle in English are actually very interesting and they help me put together this presentation. The main point in that uh, conversation was basically that uh, uh, Palladio called it figuratively because uh, Jefferson came 200 years later. And quite honestly, I don't remember how the uh, journalist um, uh, pictured this conversation. Um, but the Palladio called the Jefferson that uh, traveled to Italy, um, mentioned uh, Piedmont, uh, the rice, uh, the arborio, uh, the food, uh, and, uh, you know, after traveling so far away, especially, you know, back then, he didn't spend an extra effort to go to Veneto area and to, uh, um, and to study and to live uh, the architecture and the territory where Palladio was from and did most of his work. And um, this in particular is important because uh, Jefferson, always uh, refer as Palladio as his main inspiration. He called the four books of architecture, and we'll discuss a little bit later on, as, the, um, as his Bible. So it was not just, uh, you know, okay, I was interested, but I just didn't have the time. It was really into that. And the answer that uh, Jefferson figuratively gave to Palladio was basically that there was no need for him to, to go and to see because he already knew everything uh, because he read everything into, into his books. So, um, you know, we'll be talking a little bit, a little bit more about that. Um, but let's uh, uh, compare also this, um, these two environments in, into which both this um, personality lived and why they became as such. Um, Palladio was um, living in the Republic of uh, Venice. And uh, you can see the, the map on the left. Uh, um, this is the north of Italy. And you can see that what is now four major uh, uh, regions, the Emilia-Romagna, which is about this one, the Veneto region, which is more or less the same, and here also Lombardy and, and Piemont, uh, are, are in, back in this time fracturing to many little uh, duke, uh, duches, I don't know how to say this in English, um, duke territories like the Duchess of Savoy, the Duchess of uh, Milan, um, the Modenes of the Estensi, Mantua had another one, these were the popes, and this uh, was the only republic up there, together with the Republic of Florence. Uh, um, but the Republic of Venice was so much more powerful than any other uh, republic in Italy that was considered a threat uh, to the majority of the uh, other bigger states in Europe. Um, at this stage, there was already the uh, empire or the, or the kingdom in, in, the, uh, in Ger what is currently Germany, Spain, and France. Uh, um, and the idea of a republic where everything else there was a kingdom was always saw uh, as a major threat. So those major monarchy basically coalized and fought after uh, Venice, uh, or the Republic of Venice, to, you know, to bring basically down the spirits of um, political uh, evolution. Um, that ended up in the uh, League of Cambrai and the destructive war that destroyed the territory. Uh, Jefferson, 200 years later, faced a similar situation 
uh, with the independence war between the um, British monarchy. So not only both of them had to rebuild the territory that was destroyed, but they, at the same time, they always had to face challenges in education and culture. Um, so this, uh, I think, is the best analogy. So let's uh, talk for a second about uh, Andrea di Pietro della Gondola. Um, he was born uh, in Padua uh, in November 1508. Uh, and uh, died in Maser, uh, 1580, by the name of Andrea Palladio. Um, he lived uh, quite a bit, uh, I didn't do the math, 72 years, I believe, um, which was considerable, uh, considering, you know, the time back then was probably the average uh, uh, life cycle, lifetime was into the 40s, 50 maximum. Uh, but, uh, you know, having lived so long, uh, he wasn't Andrea Palladio uh, at the beginning. Andrea Palladio was a given name, a sort of an, an art name. And uh, he only achieved that uh, further along in his career. The same as, you know, we become who we are, maybe CEO of a corporation, senior or partner in the architectural companies. No, when you're in the 20s, uh, usually you have some apprentice and then uh, into your 40, 50, whatever is gonna be your career you become more, most likely, hopefully, a, a famous person. The same thing happened to Palladio. Um, Palladio before that uh, was uh, a bricklayer, um, so a very simple um, origins. Uh, his uh, father was a miller. His mother was um, a housewife. Uh, so, you know, it was not really coming from a big aristocracy and deep pocket that could afford to send him to university and study. He had to start immediately go to work. Um, had this uh, trouble at the beginning and uh, had to change few jobs, like uh, suppose, you know, at least I did and a few others had to do and eventually had to move from Padova and settle into Vicente. And that's why most of his um, art and most artworks and uh, architecture is located in Vicente. Um, again, uh, the challenge that he was facing was uh, reconstruction, but also was particularly challenging because the, construct the reconstruction was in Vicenza, not really in Venice. Venice, despite the war, was uh, still a relatively rich uh, territory, still had a, potent, a pretty powerful naval base, and was still uh, trading a lot with the Middle East and the uh, and the Far East, I remember Marco Polo. Um, Vicente, on the other hand, was more a territory made of farmer living, you know, uh, with whatever was available more or less around them. So whoever was building, was rebuilding the house that were destroyed by the war had only, you know, limited budget. And this is, uh, I suppose, and I, you know, I assume is a, constrained that all of us, uh, you know, all of you architects are facing when uh, your uh, customer, your client is asking you to build something. Not uh, everybody can afford, um, you know, the unlimited budget that some star architect has. Well, Palladio, he was not a star architect uh, then. It was still uh, Pietro della Gondola uh, before being called Palladio. Uh, the advantage that he had primarily was uh, the knowledge of the material and the, uh, having work for uh, Giorgio Trissino. Um, he was the one that made him uh, Palladio, or suggested or involved into Palladio, but more than that uh, was the legacy of uh, the four books of architecture that Palladio uh, wrote and got lucky to write them at the right time. Venice uh, was the first center uh, by them of, uh, printing. Um, the first Koran um, was printed in, uh, in, uh, in Venice. Um, so probably the diffusion of his thought and his um, majesty mind would not have been so big if it wasn't for this uh, good invention uh, available in his territory. Uh, fast forward 200 years, uh, uh, we go to Thomas Jefferson. Um, all of you, I suppose, know who he is. Uh, um, he is a president and not just, uh, you know, just one president. He was the founding father of uh, the United States, uh, the third president of the United States. Uh, 
And uh, he probably his most um, important masterpiece uh, was actually the Declaration of Independence. And uh, how he got to the Declaration of Independence? Well, I mean, he had the, the same challenge and sort of a history that Palladio went through. He was also from humble origin. Uh, um, his father was a farmer. Um, but again, throughout his evolution, uh, uh, acquired knowledge and uh, he was a master of uh, his time. He knew the classic uh, Latin and Greek, uh, was a, a philosopher. It was a pretty famous, you know, pretty good architect. Uh, um, and at the same time, was a lawyer and a diplomat. And most likely it's during those times, he actually resided for a long period in uh, Paris as a diplomat. And I assume it was during that period that he traveled to the north of Italy. Um, but again, when he had to rebuild uh, um, the United States, uh, rebuild from uh, a construction standpoint, of course, he used his um, uh, architectural background and experience, but also to build on a political level, and that uh, therefore the Declaration of Independence was, uh, you know, he had to inspire his thought to something. And what better than the uh, Republic of Venice, the only republic that was fighting against all the other monarchy of the time. Uh, is such a similar analogy that he had to face, or the United States had to face, uh, facing the British monarchy back then. Um, so that is, again, is another uh, element of uh, connection between the two. Um, another one was uh, the uh, construction and the planning of the, the city, the town, and the actual building. So also the construction of the roads um, they were inspired by the Roman time, which got that through uh, Palladio, and as well as the building, uh, um, if you think about the plantation in the south, uh, are very much similar, not only in style, but as a geographical location to La Rotonda. Uh, I'll take you to the next uh, slide uh, where you can see here, this on the left uh, is the um, YouTube video that I will encourage you to take a look at. And you can see that is uh, Jefferson and Palladio, an impossible dialogue. Uh, this will be the translation in English. So the, 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 the video is all Italian, but you can see that the, uh, uh, the uh, how to say, it? Uh, the wording uh, um, are actually pretty faithful. And it's only two, three minutes. On the other hand, is another video. I just took this uh, shot uh, of the uh, rotunda because this is uh, actually longer and it's only in Italian. And explain, I'm sure there's probably the English version. Um, this is actually the curator of the museum that was presenting this, uh, um, uh, the, the, this symmetry between Palladio and, the, uh, and Jefferson. And I use a lot of the information I, uh, I got from these videos to, to put together this presentation. Uh, you know, of course, together with Giacomo. Um, you can see here the, uh, um, the, the President House, because at the time it was not called the White House. Um, it became the White House because the White, and it was white because Palladio, in most of his work, and including La Rotonda, used the Bianco Avorio, which is exactly the same stone that we are promoting nowadays and uh, we extract from our quartz. And that's why the President House, uh, the way it was called back then, is now called the White House. Um, now, this was the project that Jefferson designed. Like I said, the Jefferson was also an architect and uh, you know, if he got to uh, participate to the competition for the president house, he must have been a pretty good architect, I suppose. But nonetheless, uh, um, he didn't win. And he actually participated, I assume, because of conflict of interest, uh, since he was already a diplomat uh, um, or, 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 you know, had the government status. Uh, uh, he participated uh, anonymously under a different name. And, uh, third, you know, anyway, he didn't win the, uh, the competition. Um, so, you know, for those of you that, um, you know, I suppose it's like me, we are losing some project, typically more losing than winning, um, you know, don't feel too bad. He eventually um, managed to uh, get to live in the same house that uh, he was planning, he was hoping to plan. Uh, once he actually did, um, and this 
mean, it was not exactly the same, but the White House, uh, what it would become the White House is still, uh, um, I don't remember actually having another slide and, you know, the top of my head, I don't remember who's the art design, I apologize. But he wasn't uh, um, contemplating in the project that the West Wing and the East Wing that are nowadays in, in, the, in the building. Uh, these were actually um, commissioned uh, later on by Jefferson. But, uh, and even then, Jefferson, you can see here from his sketch, uh, this is the inspiration for the Capitol building that eventually he, um, he managed to commission to uh, another architect once he became president. So here, and we are inside the Palladio Museum, and um, first of all, is uh, located in Palazzo Barbarano, um, of which uh, Grass is also a sponsor of this museum. And if you, you know, hopefully soon we'll have the opportunity to travel. I assume most of you are dealing with marble, uh, either importing or specifying, and you will have to uh, come to Italy to inspect or to check with your supplier. Uh, please let us know uh, in the previous uh, um, presentation, in the previous talk, we discussed in depth about the, uh, our quarries and our territories. Uh, so I'm not going to go too much into this uh, here. I'm presenting a little bit more what the, um, the museum and the room and the purpose of the museum. But even inside this museum, uh, which, I, like I say, you know, like I said, uh, because uh, we are also sponsored, we can uh, host events and uh, it's a good opportunity to uh, breathe uh, uh, the architecture of the time and at the same time see the same stone uh, that Palladio was using and is the same one that we are using. Here in the back, as you can see, there are three different blocks because uh, what Palladio was uh, primarily working with was the Pietra di Vicenza, which is our stone, um, Pietra di Piovene, uh, which is a quarry a little bit north uh, from where we are located now, and I'll show you on the map later on, and the uh, Pietra di Istria, which by the words is uh, located in Istria, which is on the other side of the Adriatic. Here we are seeing other aspects of the um, Palladio Museum. Uh, there's really no much, and I don't want to make uh, um, too much on this because it's not that I'm not knowledgeable. First of all, it's that I'm, you know, I'm not that familiar. I don't remember. I, I think I visited only once a long time ago it was when I was not even in the industry. Um, but um, here, uh, there's actually a nice uh, collection. It looks like a jackpot of um, 187 um, projects that either designed or inspired by Palladio. Um, there are actually 24, 23, Jack will probably confirm this later on, uh, that are uh, strictly designed by Palladio and uh, many, many others are replica, including some of the uh, recent replica. One is in uh, Palestine, I believe. Uh, um, one is in Kazakhstan, uh, in Kuwait, in Russia and Ireland, and probably I'm forgetting a few others. Um, anyway, uh, other rooms, sketches, the exterior of the museum is also worth uh, noting. And what you'll see are the uh, drawings, uh, the uh, models that have been used uh, um, and exposed. Here is a, is a close up of uh, the block because you know, we are proud of having used the blocks. And on the right, you have the stairs uh, with our Giallo di Vicenza. So it's not only a teacher. Um, a uh, piece uh, you know, to exhibit, but is also a functional piece. Uh, in many other projects, uh, our stone is actually being used nowadays because it's basically the same that uh, Palladio was using. Here are the uh, different location of his main material. And why are they important? Um, and why did he primarily use this material? Um, well, I mean, definitely the Pietra di Vicente is because it's close by and it's very, uh, you know, it's very easy to, uh, to get. Uh, same as the Pietra, um, the, uh, sorry, I forgot the blank, uh, Piovene, thank you. Uh, the Pietra di Piovene, which is actually uh, exhaust now, um, but why the Pietra uh, di Stria? Well, because it has a better resistance to uh, the salt mm, and the, uh, and you know, being immersed in water. Um, so this actual was primarily used in Venice for that reason, that specific need, and also because 
and not anywhere else because of the cost of it. Not only the cost of the material, but also the cost of extract, extraction and transportation. Uh, Venice, um, and you, you can see here, what do I mean by that? Uh, Venice uh, could afford the higher cost and higher prices because, like I said at the beginning, is a much richer city, more affluent, better client, and also had those, you know, uh, more demanding needs since the buildings are immersed in water. Uh, Vicente, of course, is on mainland, and you know the uh, the client um, over there are not the affluent and the more budget conscious. So here we see uh, this picture is not from the Palladian era, of course, because the picture was not available at the time. Uh, but you can see that uh, it's uh, pretty much a very intense labor. The, I believe this was taken in the late 30s, early 50s, so only not even 100 years ago. Uh, and very much up to then, the, uh, the workers of extracting stone that was uh, a lot of labor, a lot of, you know, a lot of very dangerous and uh, a lot of sweat. Not that nowadays is uh, easy, uh, but it's certainly easier uh, than what it was before. Uh, here is how we extract the stone um, today. So you can see that it's a machine. Um, Many of these machines are, much, are actually remote controlled. I remember, and you can see here, uh, we are actually inside the tunnel, so that's, you know, like a gallery. Gallery meaning a tunnel, I mean. Sorry about the translation uh, faults. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna spend too much time because this was the main, uh, we did 45 minutes in the previous presentation, so I will uh, refer you to that if you are interested in learning more about, uh, about the quarries that we have. Uh, but you can see that this is a completely different uh, process of extraction. Uh, over here, we have the challenge of transportation. Uh, there was no tracks, uh, but then uh, track cart and oxen was the only uh, material and means available. Um, and not always available because again, a lot of these was used uh, were primarily in uh, agriculture. Uh, so the stone was quarried primarily on weekends or in the winter where the agricultural need of the animals and the tools uh, were not uh, so demanded. Over here, you can see on the right, uh, the tracks. Uh, these are typically left from a wooden beam that are used as slide. The, the wood usually was uh, um, greased with uh, animal um, fat to make them more uh, uh, slippery, uh, you know, to create restriction so that the huge block can be uh, um, slide over that and, you know, transported for certain um, elevation or uh, loaded onto, onto a car. Well, nowadays, it's a certainly a completely different uh, approach, uh, much easier, um, although, again, it's still a challenge at, at this time, but trucks and uh, caterpillar uh, simplify the work uh, a lot. Now, um, going into the um, Palladian style, uh, um, again, uh, the, we focus here a little bit on the history and the life, and the life cycle of Palladio, how he became from an unknown stone made to a famous architect and what uh, were his quality about that. Uh, what, another good, uh, you know, stroke of luck that we had is to work for uh, George Tresino, which um, uh, back then uh, was uh, already, was a pretty wealthy um, uh, client. Well, actually, more than a client, was an employer. Um, and being an employer, uh, he had the vision of uh, evolving his employee, and he saw in Palladio, a potential and the capability that he was having with mastering the different material and saving when he was possible. So he educated and became the mentor of Palladio. He took him to Rome and was in Rome that Palladio elaborated the classical element of the Roman architecture adapted them uh, to the building uh, of this territory and the current needs of the territory. Um, 
he also adapted not only the construction of uh, um, he didn't just uh, adapt the, the construction of the architecture but adapted also architecture in a way of how to position uh, the buildings and uh, if you think he was mainly working on villas, uh, and the villas were certainly the major, uh, uh, you know, the, the place of residence of um, of the farm owners or the tradesmen. So it was a place where you can receive guests, have your meetings. So it had to be a sort of a status symbol, but at the same time had to be functional and had to be economical and sustainable. So all the land that um, were around the building typically belong to the, to, to the farm owners and these land supported the, uh, the building, supported the construction and the maintenance of the building. So where to um, he had to have room for the owners, had to have room for the servants, had to have um, geographically positioned so that if you can go take care of a problem on the east versus on the west, it was re easily be easy, easily, oh, sorry, easily accessible. Um, so geography again uh, was important. And most of all, um, economics, economics in building and economics in, in construction. Um, another typical element uh, were the uh, Venetian windows. And um, again, I keep forgetting um, the name of the two wings. There's a, there's a Venetian name, it's typical from Veneto. That's why I can, I'm from Emilia, so a different region. Um, that, uh, Originally, were more the design and thought for the aristocracy to have a stroll and to be protected for, by the elements. And Palladio transformed these uh, architectural elements. We, we'll see a drawings later on, and maybe they come up to mind the, the actual name. Um, and Palladio used actually them as a function, as a storage, as uh, warehouses, as well as uh, strolling area. Um, Palladio, like um, we said, combined a lot of elements. Stone was only one, the majority, but he was also working a lot with terracotta, was working a lot with wood and, uh, and other material. And uh, because he was using a lot in economic, in, in economical way, um, I want to stress, and this is probably my point when I'm doing this presentation to architect, uh, these are uh, two uh, images of a project that we did in Beverly Hills uh, um, using, uh, um, you know, I call it here Palladian style, uh, mainly because, you know, mainly because belong in this section of the presentation. Um, but it's also how the stone, how the floor is installed and it's produced. If you look, I had to put this mark and it took me quite a bit to figure out where the joints are. Um, for, for two reasons. Uh, most likely here, uh, and it's typical of all the architect, you want to have the, the floor as seamless as possible. And the stone can certainly do that. So if you want to have a seamless floor, why do you care so much about the size of the tile, first of all? Um, and this is why we call this random length. Uh, so random length is a great important uh, advantage versus the typical man-made product that constrain you in special size, typical sizes, like a 24 by 24, a 12 by 12, or 12 by 24, whatever is the, you know, the economical way of producing. Stone is a natural material, and as you saw from the slide before, the way we cut from the mountain, yes, it's in block because there's only way we can get it out of that. But once we have the blocks available, and this is going to be a topic of the next presentation, so I don't stay too much on that. But how we cut it is basically the same way you design. I keep on saying if we can do statue, we can do pretty much everything. So why to constrain the block and eventually the slab and the tide, the slab into tide to certain sizes? Constraining means that if I end up at the end of the slab, uh, that I have little pieces left over that I cannot make the extra tile of the specific side that is uh, requested, I have to throw it away. So, so there's a wastage there. 
in doing the random length, uh, I can just make a different size. And also, I don't have to start from a premium block or from a premium slab, but I can start from leftover or other jobs or smaller slab. And because you can see here, it's not the perspective. We are using uh, narrow and width uh, and maybe a longer length. These are all details that can be combined. Uh, typically, this is installed same width or one or two width because you want to keep this uh, um, parallel. Also, you know, for technical reason, uh, you know, you can't get the installer crazy in installing. But where the tile end doesn't really make that much of a difference, especially if you're set in, in a very uh, tight joint uh, uh, with minimum bevel like this floor here. So if you don't really care about showing the joint, uh, you know, again, why the sizes have to be a major point. Just get whatever is the best to produce. On the other hand, uh, um, and I like this effect a lot, but this is a personal style, uh, why having special uh, sizes um, when you can have random that gives you a more uh, natural look and natural effect? Uh, and in this case, you probably want to highlight the joint here and you get uh, uh, more like uh, the wood floor look when you have random plants. So this is just, uh, you know, a comparison between the two. Uh, by the way, this is uh, Grigio Argento and Bianco Amorino that we used. Uh, so the same Bianco that Palladio used for the White House. Now we are going into the uh, books of architectures, and these are just a couple of examples of uh, how they are. So you can see that Palladio is uh, not only drawing, but measuring, detailing, and doing pretty much all his homeworks. And Thomas Jefferson um, got his inspiration because of the legacy left behind. Um, I don't believe uh, Jefferson spoke Italian in the books of architecture. You can see here that the original are written in Italian. So, and like I said, they were printed uh, um, back uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Venice first. But then in the 18th century, uh, they were uh, translated into uh, English and printed in London. And that's when uh, uh, Jefferson um, you know, got, to know, uh, got to know about them, wrote about them, and memorized basically everything uh, about this book. Um, not only he speaks uh, uh, all, you know, in details about this project, but like I said before, he speaks in detail very much the material that he used and where to use one versus the other. In the same book, talking about our stone, the Peter di Vicenza, he specifically mentioned that it's a stone that needs to be worked immediately after it's quarried, um, because after a while, the more the stone stays out, the more it cures, so basically like, uh, I don't know, it's a um, So it's harder to, um, to cut and to work. Now, again, we fast forward 200 years and we are going to uh, Thomas Jefferson styles. And you can see here that the Virginia State Capitol is a perfect example that, uh, you know, if you look at the Villa La Rotonda, the other villas are very much recalling um, Palladius architectures. Um, not only the architecture is in terms of the shape of the building, but also the way he interpreted the new world, the, uh, the design uh, of, the, uh, of the building in, inside the, uh, the, uh, the, the territories that he has to build, or the uh, uh, the uh, property lines. Uh, so again, if you think about the plantation in the south, where basically Jefferson was was um, working and living primarily, the, uh, the plantation house with the owner and you know the white uh, owner lives are in the center, and maybe the slave were uh, contain, con containing in somewhere else on the side. Uh, so that the owner can control everything, can, can, can look at the worker working, whether east or south. But the other side was also the um, business and the cultural one. Again, in the, in the villa, you want to entertain your guest, you want to be proud of it. Uh, so also the functionality and the aesthetic is important, the pleasure of using the, uh, the villa. Uh, many of the Palladian villa were also frescoed, and so also here in the state capital, the ornament and, uh, and the, uh, the tympanum and the column are important part of, uh, of the design of the building. 
here we are looking basically at the same building and other perspective. Uh, can't really stay here too much. Uh, you probably know this building better than I do. Um, although I've been, you know, lucky enough to travel a few of these um, uh, buildings for pleasure and yeah, for business at one point. Uh, Barbonville is another good example of architecture and another symmetry of Palladio. While Palladio uh, kind of invented the Venetian window, um, Jefferson invented the bow window. Uh, and Jefferson, and again, in that uh, video that you will see, um, there's a sort of discussion and argument between Palladio and, um, and Jefferson where Palladio is saying, yes, you should have come visit my, uh, visit my territory and look at my building because in the actual translation, there's so many mistakes and, you know, I have all the sympathy and I'm glad I'm not the only one that translates from Italian to English making mistakes. Uh, um, but um, the uh, response that Jefferson gave to Palladio was also, no, this was an evolution. Um, and the way you're doing the window, I think I can improve. And that's why with the bow window, we can achieve more light inside of the rooms. A uh, few others that now off the top of my head, I can't really recall. Uh, but the analogy that goes between these two uh, masterpieces are, are enormous. And the influence, admiration that Jefferson had on, um, on Palladio is great. I mean, his main resident, Monticello, came from the little hill on which the Villa La Rotonda is sitting on. Uh, but you can see that um, even here, Poplar Forest uh, is exact, almost reproduction of Villa Emo. Um, with the difference that Barques, that's why, you know, I had to see them together to, uh, to have it click in my mind. Um, these uh, are called Barques, and these uh, are basically, if you think about the White House, it's the white in the middle, if you can remember the very first uh, sketch, and uh, the East Wings and the West Wings are just a reproduction of uh, what uh, he wrote in the four books of architecture, and that's why um, Jefferson, uh, uh, once he was the president, so he became from the architect, or the pre won't pretend to be art, he became the client, commissioned the, uh, the two wings, uh, the one was then the, the White House. Uh, but before that, he did the same in Monticello. In his house, uh, he reproduced the exact same um, uh, floor plan that Palladio draws um, for Villa Emo. Uh, you can see the uh, even the uh, villa, I mean, the, the, well, the main house, I should say, uh, reproduced pretty faithful what we'll see later on is uh, Villa La Rotonda. Uh, these two uh, little houses are for uh, the servants and the tools. And uh, if you have, I've been there many years ago before getting too deep into Palladio, um, but I remember it was a little bit of a hike. And another discussion that the uh, two had in that uh, figurative uh, chat that was um, that was actually Monticello was a little almost not even a hill just a little raised uh, terror elevation versus here the actual Monticello in the United States is a little bit of a hike. Here um, are material uh, that I received from a friend. Um, he was actually uh, you know part of the first presentation. I don't know if Gary is also here, um, but he gave us uh, his personal speech. He took this uh, picture in Monticello. You can see here the actual uh, uh, book uh, from um, from Palladio. These are the floor plan and the design of uh, Villa La Rotonda. And the rise is, and they told me uh, on a conversation, is because you can design a kitchen if you don't know how to cook uh, rice. And rice has a lot of connection with Jefferson that now I don't remember uh, the, the analogy that he did, uh, but I believe that Jefferson took rice from the Piedmont area and imported into the United States. Uh, I wish he could uh, uh, help us out, uh, help me out here on, on this. Um, back at the uh, Villa La Rotonda, uh, this is the view, and you can see that it's not even a, a Monticello here. Monticello means little hill. Um, uh, it's just a little raised uh, ground uh, from, from the main farmland. 
but you can see the idea that Palladio has. The, the villa should be in the middle of the farmland, supervise everything so that you can keep the eye on the worker and the crop and uh, um, you know, go after that if uh, there are problems, uh, intervene immediately. At the same time, the villa should be something to be proud of, something where you can receive uh, um, your, uh, you know, your guest uh, and, uh, you know, feature of parties uh, and so on. Um, so it was an important villa. Why was this one so famous? Primarily for the shape of it. You can see it's a perfect cross and uh, it's completely square with the round in the center. Um, the other peculiarity of it you can see from the perspective here is that whichever way you are looking at that, you always, whether it's east, west, north, south, you always see it at the same image in front of you. So again, I mean, now of course it's, oh, okay, come on easy, but the first time that you're thinking before, you know, it was never done like this. So it's always easy once everybody else has given you the idea. Um, you can see going, jumping, forward to Jefferson, um, you know, the analogy with his style, and this is another example. And again, the comparison with Villa Badoer, uh, I hope I'm saying it right. Uh, I got uh, I got some critics from my uh, Venetian uh, or Veneto colleagues. Um, but there's many other villa, this is La Malcontenta, um, and uh, is estimated, and again, Giacomo can correct me here if I'm getting it wrong, this 4,000, more than 4,000 villa that uh, one way or another have uh, a Palladio imprint of inspiration. And you can see from the cyclists that were going in front of them, uh, they're literally, you know, you know, driving by from uh, today's roads. Going back to the books, uh, um, here is how Palladio detailed everything. Uh, and his always innovative way even of uh, building stairs. Uh, you can see there are different approach to the same staircases. Uh, and whether it's round and even different approach in the oval staircases or the squared one. So his way of doing was always uh, the forefront and innovative. And he was very much on it not only describing everything, but be on top of all the workers. Uh, we'll see that, uh, and here in the Basilica Palladian, probably the most uh, famous um, or prestige uh, building that you can find in, in Venice, sorry, in Vicenza, uh, it's right on the square, you can see here, and you actually can enjoy nowadays uh, on the top of the, um, of the terrace, you can uh, have a drinks and enjoy the view and uh, uh, not only breathe architecture, but even enjoying the lifestyle of Italy and Italians today. And while you're going up here, uh, you can see some of the scribble that uh, Palladio made on the walls. Uh, just not only, I mean, to make sure that the uh, masonry and the worker um, follow faithfully what was uh, his instruction and his drawings. Palazzo Chiericati, uh, another important one, and this is a great combination of uh, using the different material. Most of this building is actually structurally made in uh, wood, not in stone. But again, his knowledge of the material and uh, is about combining them. And this is the major uh, message that I kind of want to give to people uh, that I interact with is that it's so important to, and this is also the purpose of this, uh, this seminar. It's like, you should be learning more about what is the material, where it's coming from, rather than just, uh, you know, how much it is, how many color it comes in, how many sizes, which are all important part because at the end, everything has to be blended into a palette and coordinated with other material. But it's also important that you are faithful to, uh, to what you're doing. And uh, in nowadays, um, we tend always to hide, you know, for many different reasons, which, you know, are pretty much legitimate. Um, but digging a little bit deeper and understanding the material, I think is important, just like Palladio was doing. And I'm trying to do this also to educate, although, you know, we make money in selling and get specified that, uh, I think a little bit of culture behind the business is, um, you know, taking you a little extra step. Um, 
Villa Poyana, um, probably one of the most unfinished uh, architecture of his time. And I don't know if I mentioned, I don't remember this point, um, but many of the projects that Palladio started that did not complete, the other architects had to complete. And even this one uh, uh, was actually being reviewed and um, re-changed. You can see some opening here that has been closed. Uh, uh, the barquettes on the side uh, are missing. Uh, um, but at the same time, uh, and we are very familiar, and probably Maria Vittoria can help us on this, because uh, 16 years ago, uh, they renovated the interior, uh, the floor, and uh, his, uh, her brother, uh, Francesco, architect Francesco Grassi, uh, had to follow a pretty strict protocol uh, before uh, working on the material working on the on the building although the material was exactly the same uh, he had to also to install it in a certain way and follow certain procedures so um you know um, you can certainly have more information directly from grassy uh, later on or um, as a follow-up this you can see why it was missing i mean these are the uh, the original design and uh, I, only one of these uh, was part and partially uh, but certainly missing the other wing here are the details of the uh, basement uh, and the uh, canteen. You can see that they are done with our giallo dorato. And uh, here is a shot of the stone that we used. Um, we have not only this one, and if you remember in the other uh, slide, we were talking primarily about the Bianco Avorio. Those are just two of uh, six that are the main color that we are promoting nowadays. But of course, you know, there are few other and small variation uh, between one and the others. Um, but Palladio was also, and we, sorry, uh, I just got say track for a second. Um, there's a, a pretty peculiar characteristic in the shell uh, that you would see, you saw in the previous slide. And again, in uh, the previous presentation, we went very much in details on uh, how they formed and that. And although we are promoting now five different colors, uh, um, one actually was formed 20 million years later than the other four. Sorry, I had to think about that because there's a number that is uh, beyond uh, belief. Um, so again, uh, the previous video I think was kind of interesting and I learned so much in just to, in putting that together. Um, uh, Terracotta, he, in the same villa, there's also some uh, handmade terracotta, uh, Battuto Venetiano, and uh, these are also, I mean, of course, we don't do terracotta, there's other, uh, but there's a good historical uh, uh, heritage of uh, handmade terracotta also in Veneto, not only in Tuscany. And the Battuto Venetiano, of course, is basically crushed uh, uh, pebbles and cement and, uh, and of stone mixed with cement, installed on site and the polished on site. That's why this very flush uh, uh, monolithic floor. Um, we are doing a, a similar process with our Pietra Nova, uh, which is basically taking pebbles and whatever is the leftover of the leftover. If you remember the big, you know, in the middle, a uh, few slides before we were talking about the random length in how to maximize as much as possible the use of um, uh, secondary pieces or, um, but you get to the point where you cannot even make a tile out of it. Uh, so what we normally do, um, we crush it and um, not what we normally, we do this and normally um, the leftover after is no longer usable in architecture, usually is used as a landfill for roads construction but you're really giving it uh, not even a cost. You're probably paying just to um, get rid of the debris of the quarry because like anything, you gotta keep it clean. So you can actually uh, dig into the next block if you don't take care of the leftover of the, or, you know, the one that you have in front. Um, and it's a difficult balance from people that are working in the quarry that it's, you know, it's important to keep. And this is a good way of making it economical at the same time, making something that is architecturally um, I mean, I probably wouldn't call it equivalent to the Battuto Venetiano, but uh, I can guarantee you, and, you know, we have quite an interesting project of you know, some pretty high architects uh, that uh, have used this material in their modern building. It looked pretty pristine. 
Um, it can be used uh, in many different textures and we have different colors uh, and, you know, I don't want to stay here in, in making a self pitch, but uh, it's something that uh, uh, sometimes get overlooked just because you think, oh, it's man-made. Well, yes, it is man-made, but it's actually very much nature because it's only uh, stone, lime, and, um, and water. Um, here is where everything comes from. And again, um, there's not much that I can say here, but I think it's pretty impressive. And uh, in the previous video, there's uh, even more about the quarry. Uh, I, all of the uh, Pietro di Vicenza quarry are under a tunnel. And although I've been dealing in the stone industry for uh, almost 30 years, it uh, was the only quarry that I could go under the tunnel. Every other quarry are pretty much uh, open pit. And again, uh, you can understand the difference between the two uh, and the other one. This is basically how we operate nowadays. And this is the result that once we terminate the quarry, this is just a, one of the idea that we can use uh, uh, the quarry once uh, ex you know, exploited for his primary use. And there's certainly a secondary life for that uh, is not bad. And this is just one. Um, normally, and this is sort of to wrap up this uh, conversation, if we were to do it in person, like we hope we can do it in, uh, in the museum or in our quarry or in the showroom that we just terminated, uh, um, this is how we normally we terminate and uh, hopefully we can add some result at the end. Here is a preview of uh, the next event. Uh, like uh, we said, uh, uh, we just finished our showroom and um, earlier on uh, we finished this uh, winery. And the idea is to explain you how we get from uh, the uh, raw material to your design, uh, we transform that into the building uh, using stone. Um, so that hopefully you can understand the pain and the challenge that are uh, uh, in, uh, I'm sure you have yours in design and convincing your client, but we got to take you also to reality and not over promise certain things and explain you why uh, some things are more difficult than others. Uh, like I said, this pretty much wrap up my conversation. I went a little bit over what I was hoping to keep it in the 30, 40 minutes. Uh, so I apologize for that. Um, there's so much to talk that we can't really put into here, um, but I leave here our comments and I think uh, we can open it up if there's any conversation, if there's any message that uh, has been sent uh, during this time. I can finally look at you um, who is here. And Maria Vittori, if you want to take over, or Giacomo, if you have something to add, uh, uh, this is up to you. Uh, Giorgio, you made a fantastic explanation. I think it was very clear, it was nice. Uh, and Giacomo added a pair of, you know, explanation in the chat while you were talking. If I think, you know, it was interesting, definitely. Uh, I don't know if there is any other question that you have. You, okay, there's something on, oh, thank you, Kathleen. They say favors. If you have any kind of question, feel free to get in touch, uh, either with George or with us, and we're available. Thank you so much, Timothy. Just happy uh, that you enjoyed it. Uh, I really enjoyed that. So it's uh, yeah, sure if you want to do Go more ahead. about what uh, we have talking talk to get together today, it's okay, no problem. Feel free to ask. Excellent. Um, again, um, again, you are all muted. Feel free to unmute to raise your hand. Uh, we'll be happy to, uh, you know, to conversate uh, with you. Um, I just want to say that uh, we are not professional speaker. I'm definitely not a presenter. I've been presenting and I learned how to present in just visiting, you know, architects and studios like you. And uh, usually the face-to-face -face is a little bit easier, gives me a little bit more interaction. Uh, I see you now from the first time since the beginning because I had my screen taken over by the, uh, by the presentation. Um, so sometimes it's even, you know, the expression and the faces uh, are helping and, um, you know, it's difficult here. Uh, I put Jimmy Fellow at the beginning because I like to make it a little bit more interactive with some jokes to also to, you know, keep the attention. Unfortunately, it wasn't uh, possible, uh, you know, it's not possible to do it remotely. 
And uh, I think Jimmy Fallon uh, was a good example because, you know, if you follow him or any comedians, uh, having this talk show and uh, making a joke and hearing the audience laugh, it makes you laugh too. Over here, it's difficult to make joke when, you know, you're basically laughing alone. Uh, uh, so I think there was a good analogy that uh, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't use, but I will be sending it to you. And, uh, you know, of course, if you want, and uh, you can enjoy it on your own. Um, I hope I gave you, you know, an entertaining uh, way of uh, education information. If you enjoyed, we would love to get some sort of feedback and maybe a testimonial that we can use for, you know, promoting our stone and our uh, promotional tools. Uh, like I said, I mean, I'm, we're not really a famous presenter, so getting the endorser from you uh, is certainly a good push to say, hey, I think it's worth your time uh, because these other gentlemen and your colleagues um, uh, enjoy it for this reason. Uh, we will use it uh, if you sign with your name and your uh, position uh, or anonymously if you don't want us to, uh, to, uh, to, give, to, to give us. Uh, what else? If you didn't like, if you have some critics and better way to improve it, please let us know. Uh, as much as we like the compliment, we like the critics so we can do it better. Uh, the compliments, hopefully, you can do it publicly and you can, you know, tell others. The critic, hopefully, you can do it more privately, but um, we'll take it whatever you want to give us. Uh, and uh, this pretty much wraps up for me. Um, I don't know, I saw a few other things popping up, but I'm not monitoring that. So Maria Vittoria, let me know, or Giacomo, if there's anything else that, that you, we need to add here. Everybody's happy. Just to remember that you can find uh, the registration, the recording of this. Uh, you will find it early next week, both in our website, so in grassipiedra.it or in atlanticlink.eu. Or if you have any problem, I mean, finding it, feel free to email us and we will send you the link. That's not a problem for everybody. I think everybody enjoyed that. Thank you so much again, Giorgio. I think there's no question yeah. here, so we can close it. Was fun. Excellent. See you next time. And hopefully... See you next time. Bye-bye.